Other world powers weren't surprised by the plans of America to return to the moon. Moreover, in Russia, in Europe, and even in Asian countries, different countries are already working on their own lunar programs. For example, the Russian Space Agency has announced that in the next 20 to 30 years, Russian astronauts will land on the moon. And it's even planned to build a permanent base there. The European Space Agency is developing an ambitious program, Aurora, which also involves long-term human stays on the moon in the future. China has also announced its plans to explore the moon. What's more, they've already successfully landed an unmanned module on its surface. The Chinese landed the spacecraft in the Mare Imbrium, or Sea of Showers, not far from a Russian moon rover, but it covered a distance of only 100 meters and then stopped. It is unclear why. Though the expedition had been planned to last longer, the station continued to transmit information about the surface and the temperature. It turns out that not only two or even three states are heading for the moon in the 21st century. This new moon race is beginning with a much more crowded field than it was 60 years ago. Nowadays, many countries want to take part in exploring the moon. Russia, the USA, Japan, India, China, and even the United Arab Emirates are all in the game, and the European Space Agency, of course. The moon is a large astronomical body with a constant orbit that is closest to Earth. It affects many terrestrial processes, ranging from tides in the world's oceans to our biological rhythms. Based on its phases, many calendars have been compiled, and agricultural activities and religious ceremonies have been planned. At all times, the moon excited the minds and aroused the interest of mankind. But only in the 19th century did people begin to think seriously about flying to it. And by the middle of the 20th century, that dream became reality. The era of space flights began in 1957, when, for the first time, an artificial Earth satellite was launched outside the atmosphere. It would be four years before Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. But it was already clear that new spacecraft would explore the space. In early 1959, the first lunar research probe, Luna 1, was launched by the USSR. It passed by the moon, and for the first time in history, a man-made object entered orbit around the sun. It continued operating for a long time. Luna 1 was the first spacecraft to take photos of the far side of the moon, and at first, many scientists refused to believe it. And although the first automated probe did not land on the lunar surface, it was used to obtain very valuable information about the external background radiation of our planet, the solar wind, and the lack of a magnetic field on the moon. This was the first research data about space obtained from outside the Earth. At that time, there was a rivalry between the two superpowers. In fact, the Cold War was well underway. The USA and the USSR, the two victors in World War II, began to compete in many spheres, including technology. In the spring of 1959, the American space program Pioneer 4 set off for the moon. It also gathered important information. However, the first man-made object to reach the moon was a real breakthrough in the history of mankind. And the Soviet spacecraft Luna 2 accomplished that in the fall of the same year. The first probe to touch down on the moon happened in 1959. Luna 2 landed here in the center. Actually, at that time, it was very difficult to get to the moon, and NASA managed to land its first probe only in 1965. Another achievement was more photographs of the previously uncharted area of the far side of the moon, which were obtained thanks to the Soviet space probe Luna 3. These are the pictures from Zond 3. They had a better resolution. There was not as much noise as in the earlier pictures. Thus, the first complete map of the moon was made. On the other side, it turned out that there are very few seas, less than 3% of the surface. The surface there is covered with craters. The first data about the visible side of the moon was obtained long before the era of space exploration. In the 16th century, when Galileo observed the Earth's satellite through his telescope, 
he was able to see craters, mountains, and even determine the approximate height of the peaks. It was Galileo who first called the dark spots on the moon seas. They can be seen even with the naked eye at night with a clear sky. Scientists at various times gave them quite exotic names. The Sea of Serenity, the Sea of Tranquility, the Sea of Nectar, and others. And when we look at the moon in its last quarter, we can see the ocean of storms, the sea of showers, the sea of moisture, the sea of clouds. Did you notice the difference in names? Well, at the time, the moon was believed to influence the weather on Earth. In its first quarter, the moon was thought to bring clear weather. In its last quarter, rain. This is what the modern map of the moon looks like. There are many other geographical names on it, seas, craters, and valleys. Such a map was made possible thanks to the data revealed by those first spacecraft ever to achieve lunar orbit. The mid-1960s was marked not only by the Cold War and the arms race between the two superpowers, but also by the space race, and in particular, the moon race. Despite all of the Soviet Union's successes at exploring space and the moon, the United States made an unambiguous pledge. We will be the first to land a man on the surface of the moon. And America kept that promise. In 1969, Neil Armstrong made his historic step, which truly marked a gigantic achievement for mankind. Although Soviet and American planetary probes had successfully flown around the moon several times and landed on its surface, the presence of an actual human being there was indeed a great achievement for civilization. Since then, in addition to Neil Armstrong and his crewmate Edwin Aldrin, several more astronauts have been on the moon. Six landings on the moon were carried out by American astronauts. That is, 12 people have been on the moon. These are very courageous people. They needed all their courage because every step was made for the first time. In total, since 1959, about 30 landings of various spacecraft have been made on the moon. It is said that the USSR lost the moon race to America, but did it? After the success of the Americans, the Soviet Union abandoned the costly attempt to land its own cosmonauts on the moon. But the National Space Program continued. There were several more Soviet probes, for example, Luna 5, Luna 9, and Luna 10, which studied the moon's surface in detail. And we discovered that there were many things connecting the moon and the Earth, which is very important. It became clear that the moon is actually quite strongly influenced by the Earth. It has so-called mass cons, or mass concentrations under the surface which creates a difference in crust thickness between the Earth side and the far side. In the 1970s, Soviet specialists preferred to send equipment rather than people to the moon. Soviet radio-controlled lunar rovers traveled dozens of kilometers across its surface. They collected a lot of data about its soil, made and transmitted a large number of photographs of the lunar landscape to Earth. In 1970, in 1970, the Soviets sent a huge spacecraft, Lunokhod 1, or Luna 17, and then, sometime after that, Lunokhod 2, which traveled 25 miles across its surface. They were followed in 1970, 1972, and 1976 by Luna 16, Luna 20, Luna 24. Soviet probes delivered samples of lunar soil to Earth, which were immediately sent to specialists for detailed analysis. This is moon sand. It is still kept in the Museum of Extraterrestrial Matter at the Vernadsky Institute of Geochemistry and Analytical Chemistry in Moscow. The moon and Earth are very close in their isotopic composition. This is very important. They have the same isotopic composition of oxygen, titanium, and tungsten. This is of great importance for understanding the common origin of the moon and Earth. Some scientists believe that the moon is the younger sister of our planet, and it was formed several billion years ago when a gigantic cosmic body hit the Earth, which didn't have any life on it yet. However, in recent years, 
this hypothesis is being increasingly questioned. Many scientists now think that the Moon and Earth were created at the same time. Earth and the Moon were formed from a large gas and dust cloud of enormous size. This gas and dust cloud had a certain torque, which is characteristic today for the Earth-Moon system. We know that for sure, but gradually the gas was blown out of the cloud. And when the gas was blown out, the cloud began to shrink, and it started to collapse. When it imploded, it had the same torque. So there was a process of fragmentation, and it was divided into parts. These two parts were the germs of Earth and the Moon. However, Russian scientists believe the Moon, unlike Earth, was formed much faster. Calculations show that if one object was four times bigger than the other, it would have grown 25 times bigger, and the second one will have grown only 30%. Most of the matter would be attracted to the larger mass. It just took Earth more time to form. Earth needed 120 million years to become fully formed, while for the Moon, scientists believe the period of formation was just 50 million years. It became clear how the Moon had evolved. On Earth, geographic processes actually hid all these signs of the early history of the planet's evolution. But the Moon, having no atmosphere, no oceans, and no continental drift, has retained all this evidence for us to observe. The last Soviet lunar probe, Luna 24, delivered samples of soil back to Earth in August 1976. The next time a spacecraft was sent to the moon was only in 1990. It was a Japanese satellite. Then, in the 90s, only two American planetary probes were launched into lunar orbit. It seemed interest in the moon was on the wane. The rivalry between the two superpowers in space allowed us to enrich significantly our knowledge about space in general and about the solar system. We learned a lot about the nature of the planets. However, at that time, we were not yet ready to explore the moon. It was too expensive. In addition, the main goal was to demonstrate one's capabilities to the potential adversary and not to colonize the moon. But now, in the new millennium, things have changed. Humanity is once again looking towards the moon, or rather its resources. Today, we obviously need more and more minerals because the population of the planet is constantly growing, which means that its needs are increasing. The chemical analysis of the moon's soil made back in the 1970s showed that it is rich in refractory elements such as titanium and aluminum. If you dig out an area equal to a football field, then you can find titanium, iron, calcium, potassium, and so on. But, of course, the point is not exporting them to Earth. In order to build a lunar base, all of these minerals will be needed. But the main treasure of the moon is helium-3. This is a very rare and expensive isotope. Scientists believe that helium-3 can be used in the future in fusion reactors. In fact, it could be a new source of energy for us. There's plenty of it there. We could use it for 1,000 years or even more. The energy problem could be solved for our civilization for the next 1,000 years. Of course, in 1,000 years, we'll come up with something else. According to scientists, to provide energy to the entire population of the Earth for one year takes about 30 tons of helium-3. According to the most conservative calculations, the Moon has about 500,000 tons of the isotope, and it lies just below the surface in the lunar sand, the regolith. Extracting helium-3 on the Moon would be like harvesting crops. A similar machine could be harvesting the surface of the Moon. The helium-3 is located within the first three meters. In addition to the relative availability of helium-3, it has another obvious advantage. 
When it is used, no radioactive waste is generated, so there will be no problem of its disposal, like the one which must be solved here on Earth due to the operation of nuclear power plants. However, it is still too early to talk about fusion energy. Scientists haven't found a way to control thermonuclear reactions, which means that the reactors have not been created. And so, helium-3 as a fuel is of no use either. Thermonuclear energy is only a promising direction. Most likely, this problem will be solved in this millennium, together with another equally challenging task, the colonization of the moon. Similar projects have been in the process of development in both Russia and in the United States since the middle of the last century. However, in the 70s, it became clear that no country could do it on its own. The Russian program for the colonization of the moon, called Svezda, or STAR, was shut down. America also failed to bring its plans to fruition due to their high costs. Actually, both the Americans and the Russians lost their motivation because, after all, colonizing the moon is rather expensive. But now the situation is changing. New technologies are emerging, and the colonization of the moon does not seem such an overwhelming task. I think that the issues here will be purely financial, most likely, and not technological. Technically, if we start to pursue this idea, the question might arise, is it worth spending money on it now or not? In 2017, at the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow, six people, men and women, participated in a simulated flight to the moon. They spent 17 days in a ground test module. According to the simulation, during this time, the astronauts were to have flown to the moon, flown around it, and returned to Earth. The main goal of the experiment was to work out how members of a mixed-gender crew interact with each other. Probably in the near future, it is such mixed-gender teams that will inhabit the first lunar bases. Similar training is being conducted in other countries. For the time being, each of these countries is developing its own program and conducting it alone. But most of them are ready to collaborate in some specific experiments in the near future. Well, except some big countries, for instance, China. They are conducting their own research and don't want to share it with anyone else. And the USA is collaborating only with Europe because NASA and the EU have strong ties. In recent years, enterprises of the Russian rocket and space industry have also begun active work on the creation of new spacecraft for flights to the moon. Engineers are working to create a new probe to be called Luna 25. It is planned to be launched to the moon in 2019. The main task of the spacecraft will be to work out the technology of a soft landing in the near polar region of the moon. No one has yet landed there, but the moon poles are the most promising for research and possible exploration. After all, scientists think reserves of water in the form of ice are located there. No one knows who will build the first inhabited bases on the moon and when. But this is unlikely to happen soon. For example, the Japanese do not intend to send their astronauts to the moon at all. They will probably be replaced by robots, and there will be no need to create special conditions for them. NASA is also seriously discussing the option of robots, which will be controlled from Earth. Despite all the ambitious plans, the question of the need for a person to stay permanently on the moon remains debated. It is possible to observe the moon from unmanned probes. Actually, many discoveries on the moon and maps of the surface with an accuracy of up to three feet were made with the help of these probes. And research could be continued in this way quite successfully. But why build inhabited or uninhabited bases on the moon? Scientists suggest that they can be used as scientific stations for collecting material and observing space. We do not fully understand the effects of cosmic radiation on living beings, on humans, not only in the sense of radiation's direct effects, but also in terms of, for example, what effect it has on memory, on the brain, or on the ability to make decisions. And the moon could be the biomedical center for studying those questions. You could, for example, send some sort of colony of simple organisms there, then bring them back to Earth, laboratories, and investigate genetic 
or some other changes. Space agencies of different countries view the moon in the future as a transit point for flights to other planets. Such theoretical projects exist already. Gravity on the moon is six times weaker than the Earth's, and therefore, it would be much cheaper to launch a rocket to Mars from there, since less fuel will be needed. But to do this, we will need to build a launch pad on the moon, and hence the base for the employees of the lunar space port with everything necessary to sustain life. Such a manned base could also be used for commercial purposes. Space tourists from Earth could stay there. Perhaps one day it will be possible to buy a ticket to the moon, just like now we can buy a ticket to some exotic islands. In any case, enterprising Americans are already looking for volunteers to visit Earth's natural satellite. However, how realistic is it to make the moon suitable for life? It is one thing to walk on its surface, but staying there for a couple of days is totally different. Although a person can live on the International Space Station for a year or more, on a moon station the crew would need to be changed once a month, otherwise they would have to be treated for radiation sickness. Calculations show that an astronaut, after 100 hours on the moon, will receive a dose of radiation that is dangerous to health. And in case of a solar flare, this could happen in a matter of minutes. Therefore, experts say that it's preferable to live under its surface, not above. The moon's surface is made of very durable material from basalt. Basalt is so strong that you make tunnels inside it. You won't need any structural reinforcing to support them. Simply put, you dig a tunnel and live in it. Moreover, under the surface of the moon, we can use basalt to extract oxygen, which is so vital for human life. The basalt consists of silicon dioxide and metal oxides in almost equal proportions. And therefore, if we squeeze oxygen out of the basalt, then along the way, we'll also get iron, titanium, manganese, and magnesium. So it's an entire array of different metals that will be available to us. On Earth, one of the main requirements for life is water. And today, we know that the moon has it. Launched in 1994, an American spacecraft named Clementine had a neutron sensor, which showed some anomalies that could indicate the presence of water. After that, the U.S. launched Lunar Prospector. This was a scientific satellite, which confirmed, indeed, the presence of water. Scientists claim that water is contained at the bottom of the lunar craters in the form of ice stocks, but nobody knows how much water they contain. Despite all our modern technology, mankind is not yet ready for the full-scale colonization of the lunar surface. Much remains to be understood and calculated, and the pros and cons still need to be weighed. Therefore, experts believe that the current moon race will not be as intense as the first one, because today there is no fierce rivalry and the pioneers long ago accomplished their goals. We've learned a lot about the moon, but it is still actively researched by scientists all over the world and holds a lot of mysteries. And we still have ambitious plans for it. Humanity today thinks of the moon as the seventh continent, which holds great wealth in its depth. And if we do manage to explore and set on the moon, I hope it happens in a peaceful way and for the benefit of all here on Earth. My name is Vladimir Surdin. See you next time.